My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Justin Kong. Myths of unrestricted meritocracy notwithstanding, the kinds of opportunities we have to engage in paid work and to make lives for ourselves tend to correlate quite strongly with who we are. It's certainly not absolute, but rather testifies to the powerful and persistent relevance of the barriers that different groups face. Barriers organized into people's lives in relation to their experiences of gender, class, migration, citizenship, racial background, disability, sexuality, and more. These barriers are real, lived, and felt every day. It's the sexual harassment. It's getting fewer job interviews because you have this type of name rather than that type of name. It's your qualifications not being recognized because you got them in another country. It's not having the money to pursue education or some other sort of opportunity. It's having a work permit that ties you to a single employer or immigration rules that limit your ability to speak out and access social supports. It's being streamed into non-academic courses because of racial stereotypes. It's all of these things and countless more, and in an overall context that depends on having significant numbers of people who work in precarious, low-wage, unpleasant, and often unsafe jobs. Justin Kong is the executive director of the Chinese-Canadian National Council Toronto Chapter, an organization committed to social justice and equity that's been around for about 40 years. He's also the project lead and organizer in an initiative they've been running over the last two years called the Chinese Grocery Store Worker Project. In many racialized immigrant communities in Canada, including those with roots in China, racism and exclusion from other sorts of opportunities tend to encourage the formation of certain kinds of small businesses in which the owners and workers, and in some instances the main customer base, share an ethnic background. Barriers related to things like language, migration and citizenship, and racism, as well as barriers to accessing education and training, mean that particularly for working class people in these communities, working in these kinds of businesses can be among the more accessible options available to them to earn a living. But low pay, precarious employment, lousy conditions, and mistreatment by employers are just as likely in what you might call the ethnic economy as they are in similar kinds of workplaces in the mainstream economy. And the barriers that the people working in, say, Chinese grocery stores and restaurants can face in asserting their rights and dignity can be even greater than those faced by other precarious workers precisely because of things like how the migration system gets weaponized against them, the structural barriers they face to finding other jobs, and so on. Kong and others involved in the CCNC had been hearing anecdotally from workers about some of these problems, and they decided they needed to do something. The goal of the Chinese Grocery Store Worker Project is to learn more about the conditions that these workers face, to build relationships with them, and to support them in asserting their rights and in building collective power. While they're certainly in favor of formal unionization, at the moment conditions are such that most of what they do involves less formal kinds of organizing. This includes working to address small, winnable demands in specific workplaces. It includes building up mutual aid networks and sources of support in the community and among workers. And all of this is done with an eye towards larger-scale organization and mobilization and the building of broader worker power in the longer term. Now, of course, is a particularly challenging moment. As word of COVID-19 first began to circulate, racist responses by the general public resulted in many Chinese and other Asian-owned businesses losing customers and therefore laying off workers. Now that the pandemic has truly begun to hit, workers in Chinese grocery stores, like all grocery workers, are on the front lines, so they're afraid of infection, and they lack the social and employment supports they would need to be able to truly protect themselves. And, given the unprecedented economic downturn that is only beginning to manifest, there's fear of much worse job loss ahead. I talk with Kong about organizing workers in Chinese grocery stores and beyond, and about doing so in the context of the current pandemic. My name is Justin Kong. I'm a organizer and executive director at the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto. Our work with the grocery store workers in the Chinese community is part of the work that we do at the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto chapter. We work with workers in different sectors, grocery stores, you know, restaurants, stuff like that. 
like many Chinese Canadian folks who grew up here, live here, you know, folks like my family member and my parents were also folks, you know, who at one point in time when they immigrated to Canada worked in these jobs. That's for me personally what connects me to a lot of the work is my own family's experiences with precarious work as they exist across working class communities, immigrant communities, right? When I finished my undergraduate studies, I, like many young people and many working class people and, you know, racialized immigrant communities, it was really hard for me to get a job, right? And so I, I started working through a temp agency. Through working at the temp agency, I really saw how bad conditions were, right? I mean, I'd worked previous jobs before, of course, but just seeing that and how, you know, pervasive precarious work is in Canada and across the world. And seeing that for people like myself, right, you know, second generation immigrants, you know, one provide generation immigrants, our parents who came here, you know, the dream that the children would be able to get the jobs and whatnot. But seeing that even then, so many of us, we're stuck in these precarious dead end jobs. That really illustrated to me the importance of really doing that work and doing that organizing and fighting for, you know, decent work and fighting for fair labor laws and, and fighting for worker power, right? That's how I became, like, personally involved in, in workers' rights organizing. It was through my own experience working as a temp agency worker in Scarborough and, you know, seeing that many other people like me were there right, and in that situation. Tell me about the Chinese Canadian National Council and about the kinds of things it does aside from the project we're going to be focusing on today. The Chinese Canadian National Council has been around for about 40 years now. We're the Toronto chapter. I think over time, a lot of the chapters have disappeared, but we're still around. And we do a lot of grassroots organizing work in the community around, you know, political education, raising awareness around different social issues. Yeah, so education, advocacy, and community organizing. How did the Chinese Grocery Store Worker Project get started? We started seeing a lot of folks who were working in this sector and having a lot of issues. We always knew personally or anecdotally that, you know, conditions weren't great. And so it was over time hearing more and more about it and then thinking about the importance of building worker power in, in the community that we decided to engage in this project and work through it. So on your website, you use the language of ethnic economy or immigrant community economy. Describe for listeners what you mean by that and talk about what is specific about the experiences of workers in those kinds of contexts and about what they have in common with low-wage workers more broadly. The main point is how capitalism really and national boundaries create differential pockets of labor pools and how often those labor pools are immigrant workers, migrant workers, you know, racialized workers, women workers, often are some of the most marginalized and peripheral pockets of labor in any society, really, right? We can think about migrant labor globally, right? Specifically, how that manifests here in Canada is when we think about labor as a movement or labor as organizing, that's not often the first thing that comes to mind, even though there is a lot of amazing organizing that migrant workers are doing, immigrant workers are doing. The CCNC Toronto is part of the Migrant Rights Network, and the organizing that they do is with migrant workers. Similarly, a lot of the organizing that we do is also with migrant workers, immigrant workers. So yeah, so often when we talk, think about like labor standards, it's like, how do we ensure there is a labor standard while recognizing that, you know, the structural forces that we just discussed earlier, you know, capitalism, nation states, inherently often create conditions where there are people who have to subsist under those minimum conditions. And so as part of that, how do we make demands for better minimum conditions through building worker power? And also make sure that, you know, there are minimum protections for, for all workers. Spell out a little bit more explicitly for listeners the ways in which borders and barriers related to migration policy play a role in creating this segmented labor market. For example, if we don't have permanent status, often it becomes a lot more difficult to access a lot of services or protections or even like training opportunities. The precarity that produces requires people to often, you know, work jobs that may be under the table or work jobs that, you know, where they're not getting minimum standards. And so our work has both a lot of workers in those situations where workers may not be getting the minimum wage, they may not be getting benefits at all. So the work is with the communities and the groups of workers that are often not protected by labor standards. So from what you've said today and from what's on your website, you work with workers in a range of different kinds of workplaces. Why did you choose grocery store workers in particular as the focal point for at least the name of the project? The food chains, as we are seeing right now, of the coronavirus and whatnot, are very important. 
grocery stores and grocery workers are actually super critical to providing subsistence for people. Certainly that was part of it going in, like recognizing that actually this is a major industry for many people, but also recognizing that conditions there often tended to be really bad, despite them being, you know, large establishments. And so our decision to work with grocery store workers really was that, yeah, there was a lot of people working in grocery stores and they were getting in touch with us and we were getting connected with them and we were hearing about the issues. That's why we decided to do that organizing. And what kinds of things were you hearing specifically from grocery store workers? A lot of things from, you know, minimum wage, so not getting minimum wage, not getting overtime pay, not getting holiday pay, workplace injuries, all sorts of things around just like employment standards and poor working conditions are things that we often see and hear from workers in the community. What were the early steps of going from that sense that you needed to do something to actually turning this project into reality? I think the importance of was really like grounding ourselves in the community and taking leadership from the workers, right? And building those connections within the community and building the bridges to allow those conversations to happen. That's the biggest jump, right? Once you build those connections, you build those relationships, you can begin to do the organizing work. What did the work of building those relationships involve? Like a lot of it is doing outreach in the community, talking to folks who work at grocery stores. And just like personal networks, because a lot of times there's like kinship networks interwoven. Maybe the workers are from the same hometown. Maybe they share a dialect. So tapping into those types of connections and talking to people through like connecting in person or over social media on WeChat or whatnot. And just generally building that trust and building those relationships with workers in the community and then learning in that process. And is it mostly that kind of one-on-one outreach you just described? Or as part of it, do you organize like public events and more collective activities as well? It's a bit of both. It often includes talking to folks when they're not working, talking to folks in the community, reaching out online, or sometimes even visiting like, you know, when we're buying stuff at the grocery store, right? Maybe just talking to folks there. There's a whole combination of methods to build relationships and build trust and build connections with the workers in the community. Do you run into instances where workers are wary of what you're doing and they're maybe hesitant to get involved? I think always when doing organizing, whether it's, you know, in the community or in the workplace, there's always fears and there's always concerns. So I think really like walking folks through the process and explaining stuff to them and always recognizing that sometimes people aren't ready and that's okay, but that we're here and we're here to support the community. We're here to support the workers and that we'll try to be there, right? We aim to be here. For example, right now in the coronavirus, we aim to, you know, continue to support these workers and the community in these changing conditions. The hope is that over time we can build that community trust and build that solidarity. So, yeah, I think there's always fears and always challenges. And so we we try to work through that together collectively. Has this project also involved building partnerships with other groups and organizations? Yeah, so we we work with a lot of different organizations at the CCNC Toronto. Specifically on this project, we work with other folks in the labor rights movement, the decent work movement, injured workers, and just generally other community groups that work with workers. So whether that's like nonprofit agencies or religious communities and so forth, really trying to connect to different folks and making sure that we're building together and making sure that, you know, we're tapping into the strengths of each other. So you laid some of the groundwork in terms of building relationships with workers and some partnerships in the community. Where have things gone next? A lot of the folks who are involved in the project have either directly worked in the grocery stores or, yeah, basically a large majority of the folks have worked in the grocery stores. And so as worker-led organizing, connecting with workers and then like supporting them through the enforcement of their rights and then getting them to be organizers and leaders and activists in the community is part of it too, right? So that was the next step connecting with the workers and then supporting them through the issues and then engaging them as organizers. Walk me through some specific instances. Say you're talking with a worker and they say, you know, I've been working at this place for six months and they're still not paying me the minimum wage. What would the next steps be? So it's quite interesting because it never actually comes out like that. And then part of that is because, like, often there's assumptions around, like, oh, workers don't know their rights. That's the problem. But that's not the problem, right? The problem is when you're working under conditions, when you don't feel like you have a bargaining power at work, even when you're not getting your rights, often workers will just accept that, especially if you're, like, an older worker, if you don't speak English, right? If you're a new immigrant, if you have a lot of family to support. 
And so when we often connect with workers, it's rarely immediately about the wage issue. It may be often something else like, oh, they're having an issue with, you know, immigration or they're having an issue with, you know, their housing situation or they have a family issue or, you know, they got injured at work or they're looking to apply for EI. And then it so happens that, you know, through that process, we have those conversations about rights, about work, and then we can have the conversation about wages and, you know, benefits. Because I guess wages is, is often a big part, but that's often not the only part, only issue facing immigrant workers and workers in the sector. One response that some people, including some labor movement people, might have is, well, shouldn't the first step be organizing a union in a formal sense? Talk about why that's not necessarily a useful first step. I'm always in favor of unionizing or creating collective forms of bargaining power. I think that just always makes sense. But I think one of the challenges is the specific population that you're working with. How can you unionize if people are worried that if they sign a union card, they might get deported? How can you unionize if the employer has managed to control the workplace through controlling like key managers or through like putting in close friends or family members in key leadership positions where they monopolize power in the workplace? Those are all situations where we see the challenges of unionizing and it makes it different than like your traditional union drive where maybe, you know, the workers and the employers have no relationship outside of the workplace. Here, we're looking at more complicated relationships. Sometimes there's some family relationship. Sometimes there's some kinship relationship. There often is like immigration barriers that prevent people from fully exerting their rights, whether they're, you know, an international student or they're a migrant worker or they're on a visitor visa, so on and so forth, right? So various issues really create a lot of barriers for people to fully exert their rights as workers. And I think that connects to another, not fundamental difference, but difference in emphasis. In some formal labor contexts, there's lots of talk of, you know, fighting the boss. And I'm sure you agree that's important too. But it seems like in the context in which you're working, there has to be a bigger emphasis on mutual aid kinds of work. Talk about that difference. The fighting the boss component is still there. And it's always there, right? But I think what we've been seeing is how much it takes, how much actual capital it takes to fight the boss. What that means is like, if you don't speak English, if you're a senior, if you have precarious legal status, each of those things inhibit you from fighting your boss. And so the things that we try to do is how do we create support systems that not only support these people in their lives, broadly speaking, but also empower them and create forms of solidarity that allow them to demand more of their bosses. And so that's what we've been doing. Maybe they aren't able to immediately form a union. But suddenly they feel like I can demand more, right? I can be like, well, this is not fair. I'm not doing this. You have to give me this or so on and so forth. That's the kind of effect we're trying to have. And if it so happens that we're at a point where, you know, analytically speaking, or the workers feel that they can form a union, then I think that would make sense. But the process is recognizing just how many barriers there are to that fighting of the boss. Because it's not only are you fighting the boss, you're fighting immigration, you're fighting white supremacy, you're fighting ageism, you're fighting sexism. All of these things, what it does is it isolates and it marginalizes and it makes peripheral these workers. And so what we try to do is create the support system and the solidarity to diminish the barriers each of these aspects has on the immediate lives of people. And then in doing so, not only empower, but also create that power in the workplace where workers can demand more. And in the broad set of circumstances where formal unionization isn't realistic, or at least isn't yet, what other sorts of collective forms and ways of enforcing workplace rights do workers make use of? A lot of it is, like I was saying, building the connections of workers and then walking through like different strategies or different methods that workers can self-advocate or get support from the community to advocate for them. That's what it looks like. Do you run across instances where employers weaponize the immigration system to disrupt organizing and keep workers in line? I think always, like, inherently, the immigration system is weaponized by employers, by the state, to create a docile and subservient workforce. So definitely, we've heard of instances where workers have been threatened by the employer that, you know, like, if you go forward with this, we're going to, you know, call immigration and whatnot. So the types of vulnerability there are a challenge. In doing this work, what kinds of support are you getting from the formal labor movement, and what kinds of support would you like to be getting from them? 
We work with some unions, like some folks from the labor movement have come out to support us, whether that's in a direct action or just generally sharing information. But I think it would be great if organized labor can really dedicate more resources to supporting migrant workers and workers at the periphery. Because politically speaking, the stronger workers are in immigrant communities, the stronger labor is as a whole. So the better we are able to build up the power of immigrant workers and racialized workers and migrant workers who are not often directly involved within our labor movements or are not as much as they should be, the better we are able to build power collectively and across communities to make demands on the state, right, and to fight for things that we all need. There's great work happening, you know, at the Workers' Action Center, migrant organizing work as well. And so the work we do at CCNC Toronto is part of that larger attempt by, you know, often a lot of racialized folks, immigrant folks, to build up that power. Given the changing landscape of Canada and the changing landscape of precarious employment, we need to build. We need to build labor intersectionally, diversely. And when we are able to do that and really able to build those solidarity, that's when we'll be able to challenge the state and challenge capital to make demands for all working people. Given the sorts of multiple and intersecting barriers that the workers that you work with are facing, what would be some of the key demands you would make of the state, key reforms you would want to fight for? So, for example, one of the big barriers is migrant workers don't have status or, you know, they have precarious legal status. And so that's like an important demand. For example, making sure that everyone can access OHIP. That's very important, right? Making sure there's no deportation. Stuff like that is super important making sure that there is permanent status on arrival and making sure that, you know, immigration is more inclusive so that working families can actually afford and it's not just for the rich and the powerful, right? Or that working people don't have to go to extreme measures to be able to achieve the requirements in order to bring their family members over. So I think at the federal level, those are some things that would be really important and really great. And then thinking about like enforcement of minimum standards, I think there's a lot of stuff in terms of policy that needs to change. The folks that we work closely with at the Workers' Action Center and the Fight for Fifteen and Fairness, they've laid out a lot of those policy points, which we agree with very much. And it would help workers in the Chinese grocery store and the Chinese like restaurant sector. And we're doing the organizing like in the Chinese community, but the parallels exist in every racialized migrant community. And there are really great folks who are doing organizing in those sectors. And so supporting organizations that are doing this work, supporting organizations that are doing that type of organizing is critical to building up that power to fight for the working class and to make demands on the state and capital. And we're speaking today in the context of what is probably a fairly early stage of the pandemic. Of course, one of the things that's arisen with that is a lot of anti-Chinese racism in Canada and other Western countries. So talk a bit about how this crisis is affecting the workers that you work with. Yeah, so I think the workers in the grocery stores, I mean, there is general racism, you know, violence and discrimination targeting Asian or Chinese communities. And then there's the economic part of it, where it's like, we're going to stay away from the Chinese people, we're going to stay away from Asian malls, we're going to stay away from like Asian grocery stores, which has produced an impact on how well those communities are able to make a living. So many of the workers who we've been working with have been, you know, having hours cut. Some have been losing jobs. Departments have closed down. And we continue to support those workers in that process and work with them as they face their conditions. Many of the grocery store workers we work with also are on the front line of this. So they're scared about getting infected. The ones who haven't lost their jobs are scared about getting infected. And then it comes back to like, so if you're here on a temporary status and you don't have access to OHIP, then how do you protect yourself? What happens if you get sick? There's all these questions that people are very concerned about in the sector. So we're just trying to like support the folks in that process. But yeah, the COVID-19 has been a huge damage. Will these people be able to get support if they lose their jobs, migrant workers and workers who have temporary status, who are often also the most marginalized, right? So yeah, supporting folks through those platforms is. What would you like to be seeing from the broader labor movement, from other social movements in this moment, in terms of what might adequately address both the economic impacts of this crisis on the workers that you work with and the heightened racism that they're facing? Obviously, you know, standing up and speaking out against it is really important, the racism, and really demanding policies that are inclusive. Many people can't get EI, so like organized labor can't just fight for EI. 
it can't just fight for stuff that its members need, right? It has to fight for stuff for the whole working class. And if it can't do that, then we're going to be in a bad situation to fight against capital and the state to make demands on the state. Organized labor has to be advocating and organizing and supporting the organizing of the entire working class. And hopefully in this virus, they can do it by fighting against racism, even within their own membership. Doing the anti-racism work is really important, and they should keep doing it. But also committing resources to supporting the organizing of migrant workers and immigrant workers and other precarious workers, because it's hard. We operate with such limited resources. So when labor is able to like support not just us, but the social movements and the people that are doing amazing organizing across Canada, across the GTA, folks doing indigenous solidarity organizing, folks doing anti-racism, anti-police brutality organizing, folks doing migrant justice organizing. When labor is able to stand behind these folks and support them, I think we'll be able to build a bigger tent and build up labor to really make demands and to fight against injustice and inequality. So focusing again on the Chinese Grocery Store Workers Project specifically, what are you going to be doing in the coming months? Because of the coronavirus, we've been doing a lot of mutual aid and a lot of like supporting workers who are working or who have lost their jobs. So that's our main focus right now is to do the crisis control stuff. The coronavirus represents both a real challenge and a real opportunity to build and have conversations and engage and support. So, yeah, we hope to continue engaging the workers and continue to engage the community to continue to build up those bonds of solidarity and trust throughout this very difficult period. We've been doing a lot of work around advocating for more inclusive income support for many workers through the COVID-19 period. And then I think we really have to fight against ideas of scarcity. There is enough. And understandably, you know, working people feel like, well, there's not enough out there. I need my hours, right? But I think what we really have to fight against is this notions of scarcity and uh, there isn't enough. You know, if we give, you know, immigrants this or you give migrant workers this, then there won't be enough for us. Well, actually, we see throughout this crisis, there is enough. There's so much. There's so much that we can do. It's just a matter of do we have the political power and the political will to demand it, to fight for it and to win it. You have been listening to my interview with Justin Kong of the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto Chapter. We've been talking about the Chinese Grocery Store Worker Project. To learn more about it, go to ccnctoronto.ca. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. (laughs) 